Our next segment today is on youth mental health and the youth mental health crisis in America. As many of you know, mental illness disproportionately affects young people. The statistics are quite heartbreaking. About 50% of lifetime men mental illnesses begin by age 14, 50%, and 75% show up by age 24. One out of every six kids between the ages of six to 17 experience a mental health issue each year. According to the 2021 report from Mental Health America, 9.7% of youth in the US have severe major depression. This rate was highest among youth who identify as more than one race at 12.4%. And according to the CDC, suicide was the second leading cause of death among individuals between the ages of 10 and 34. These statistics, however, do not do full justice in depicting the suffering that these mental illnesses wreck on young people, their families, caregivers, and of course, society at large. Suffering that is compounded, unfortunately, by the stigma that society attaches to these disorders. And that is where the power of storytelling comes into the picture. Today, it is my absolute honor to welcome filmmakers Eric Ewers and Christopher Lauren Ewers co-founders of the Ewers Brothers Productions. Eric and Chris are co-directing the upcoming miniseries, Hiding in Plain Sight, executive produced by the famed documentarian, Ken Burns. The, news, uh, the upcoming film series, Hiding in Plain Sight, will chronicle the mental health issues faced by young people in the US. Eric has been an Emmy and ACE award-winning film editor for Ken Burns for more than 30 years, collaborating on more than 25 of Ken's films. Eric has also served as a co-director with Ken and his brother, Chris, for 15 years. Co-director and cinematographer Chris's career be behind the camera has spanned over 20 years. He's a commercial director and director of photography, and his cinematography has been featured in each of Ken's films since the Vietnam War. Thank you so much, Eric and Chris, for participating in the Decode Summit. Thank you. Thank you. At Eric's and Chris's request, we will begin this segment by showing a brief excerpt from their documentary in progress, Hiding in Plain Sight. The only thing I know how to do is to share my own story and my own experience. I can't tell anyone what they can't see for themselves, but I can tell them what it was like for me what happened to me and what it's like now that I have recognized my own illness. It was something in the back of my head, really. It was not something that I didn't really worry about. My dad was an alcoholic and just like the anxiety of him coming home at night. It's a strange thing to look back on and think to myself, I really didn't care about anything at that point. I remember a lot of nights where I would sit in my bed and cry, like, for hours after hours. I felt a lot of pain inside, and um, I, couldn't, I couldn't explain that. I couldn't relay that to other people outside. The feeling is like walking through, um, it's like being pulled down, being pulled into, like, quicksand. It affects my daily life all day, every day. I go to school. You know, you put on a face, a facade, you're happy, you're bubbly, and then you eat lunch alone in the bathroom. I started to self-harm. I learned it in a book that I read. I'm tired of the, I'm tired of the voices. I'm tired of everybody labeling me and saying that I'm crazy. What happens to people with a serious mental illness is that just like a serious cancer, it begins to metastasize. It, it, it turns into disability. I remember waking up and being in the psych ward and being like, what am I doing here? I had a very high opinion of myself. It gets complicated by substance abuse. Drugs and alcohol worked very well for me because they took that anxiety that I had and that sense of isolation and they eliminated those things drugs and drinking and um, that was kind of my excuse like that outside excuse to to match up that feeling of powerlessness inside 
when I finally did like start to think like, oh, I'm probably an addict, I was like, no, like you're just lying to yourself, you know? When the suicide rate goes up, nobody even knows about it. I still had a whole future that I had planned, you know, it's like I was planning the suicide, but at the same time, you know, I was making plans to like go out to the movies with my friends the next week. My life was gonna end one way, and that was being addicted to drugs, so why not start now? Like, I wasn't meant to be on this earth. Long sleeves, no one knew that what I was, no one knew what was on my wrist. It was actually on social media. These boys were harassing me about something I did. I, like, couldn't deal with it anymore. Yeah, I actually went through with it. I actually tried to hurt myself. Those are the moments where I have the best opportunity to plant a seed in someone else's mind. The fact of the matter is, if you don't show some vulnerability, if you don't speak honestly, then there's no truth. And if there's no truth, there's no connection. It's taken me a very, very long time to even speak openly about it. I think there's a lot of pressure in being vulnerable, especially now with social media and everyone judging you. My roommates don't even know half of this stuff that I'm telling you guys now. And I'm nervous, like I'm kind of shaking inside to even talk about it. But if I can even reach two people from everything I say or this story, then I, I did my part in this world. We don't understand how common it is. We don't understand how important it is to talk about it and be open about it. So this is the problem that we all deal with in secret. And the result is that we don't deal with it well. You know, you know, like science, um, our process of making documentary films, it's actually a process of discovery. Um, it's a, a evolving process. Um, and I gotta tell you, it's never been more applicable than this topic that we're dealing with right now. Um, it is such a large topic. And, you know, when WIDA first came to us, they requested that we focus on youth mental health. So our first step was to begin a, a research and development phase where we talked to some very prominent mental health advocates like Patrick Kennedy and Tom Insel and the Staglin family, Joshua Gordon, Steve Hyman, Mary Giliberti, uh, Nora Volkoff, Ellen Sachs, a lot of people that I'm sure are familiar. Um, and their great advice led us to more frontline people as we like to call them. Um, including a, a Boys and Girls Club director in Brattleboro, Vermont, a social worker from Rhode Island, um, countless parents, homeless advocates, a child psychologist, a court judge, even a prison guard. And after talking to all those people, it became very clear to us that perhaps after doing the interview with Tom Insel for this film and Patrick Kennedy, that we should just try out a little experiment, film someone with lived experience. Uh, we weren't quite sure how to do it. We didn't know what we would discover when we did it. So we interviewed this young woman named Sam in Brattleboro, Vermont. She literally opened the door to a whole new reality that neither Chris nor I could ever possibly imagine. By doing that interview with her, it led us to three fundamental conclusions as far as the film's concerned. The subject is way too big for one two hour film. So therefore we intend to commit to three films over 10 years, each of them being at least two episodes in length, if not more. And each of them addressing a di different aspect of mental health and each of them having a different focus group. The first of which being our youth. The second thing that we realized, actually Patrick Kennedy best summed it up. 
he said that if you're walking down a street and you see someone screaming angrily, babbling incoherently on the side of the road, what do you do? You cross the street. But if you see that same person bleeding or fallen over, you would rush over to help. Here lies the problem that we all face in our culture with mental health. The stigma is really, really great. And given this ever-present stigma, Chris and I realized that this first film really needs to be all about lived experience. We need to uncover it. We need to put it on display in a respectful way and with integrity. We need to not sensationalize it, but stay true to the stories of our youth. Let them, they are the experts of their own lives. Let them tell the story and perhaps open the eyes of many people who might not take it as seriously as they do. We also hope that we can foster empathy and compassion through this first film. After all, bigger conversations about mental health can't happen unless we have this fundamental conversation first, hence our first film. And then in our second and third film, we can address other aspects of mental health, including science and research, the politics, and the American landscape as far as the successes and failures in the mental health care system. So we actually, after Tom and Patrick, we decided we're gonna stop interviewing experts for a while because we need to be better informed. We need to understand where today's youth from children, young children all the way to young adults, we need to understand where they're coming from and how we can make a film that will address their needs. Chris? Thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, to, uh, to, to expand on what Eric was saying, you know, our primary goal with this first film, as he said, was, was to normalize the experience of mental illness. Um, you know, we need, with this film and, you know, in conjunction with, with so many other incredible, you know, organizations and individuals who are, you know, striving for the same, towards the same goal, we need our film uh, to create essentially a, a foundation of relatability, empathy, um, understanding, and I think most importantly, perhaps most importantly, acceptance. Um, you know, we know that this conversation is slow to start because we're, you know, in, in many regards, we're still debating as to whether or not in, in some circles, uh, we're still debating as to whether or not mental illness is actually an illness, actually a disease. Um, so we set out to create a, a film that would give voice to these people to the to uh, as wide uh, and diverse a group uh, of people with lived experience as we as we possibly could. Um, we're looking for or we were and still are looking for diversity in diagnosis, in lived experience, in uh, you know uh, ethnicity, race, uh, cultural identity, uh, you know gender identity socioeconomic standing, even geographic location plays, as we all know, a, a major role in, in all of this. Um, and so that's what we set out to do. I think that uh, in, in the beginning, and this was about a year and a half ago, um, we decided that we wanted, in order to do this, we wanted to, to seek out honest, raw um, conversations. Uh, we wanted to, to find the untrained voices, the, uh, you know, those of us, the everyday people who had never been in front of a camera before. And we wanted to, to, to experience their challenges. We wanted to hear about their experiences, uh, their struggles firsthand. Um, that was of course <laughs> a daunting experience, uh, or challenge to begin with. Um, but we, we ended up relying heavily on, grassroots organizations, national organizations like the Boys and Girls Club initially, um, you know, and as well as, as some of the experts that Eric had mentioned that we'd sought out, everybody, uh, we, were, we were pleasantly um, blown away by the level of support that we received um, in, this, in this early venture. Um, we were able to and, and continue to find uh, what we've now come to, to describe as heroes, um, these, these incredible um, individuals ranging in age from I think our early our youngest interviewee is 11 years old 
uh, predominantly through about you know 25, but including a couple of, of adults as well whose experiences um, you know they relate back to whose experiences were in their teenage years. Um, we have found them all over the country, um, and 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 thankfully so in, in such a in such a diversity that we really do feel as though we're collecting the story of at very least American mental illness. Um, it's our hope that the viewers who tune in uh, to watch this, regardless of their their preconceived notions, their previous understanding or opinion of mental illness, mental health challenges, that they will see somebody presented in the film that they can relate to, uh, whether it be, you know, they start to see their their mother or father, uh, their children, their coworkers, their best friends, their neighbors differently uh, with more empathy. Uh, you know, it is hiding in plain sight. Um, not a single person, we believe there's not a single person on the planet uh, that isn't influenced and touched in some way, shape or form, whether it be directly or indirectly by, uh, you know, by challenges with mental health. Um, and, you know, it's, it's our commitment uh, to telling these stories in a, in a manner that we hope can, you know, can start to push the needle. Um, what else? I mean, uh, we, we have another film, we have another clip uh, that we want to show um, this clip from uh, one of the stigma chapters in our film. We think that, uh, that, you know, stigma, as Eric had mentioned earlier, is, is one of, uh, is one of the most pressing, certainly the most common issues, um, that is, that affects people of, across the spectrum, uh, who are suffering with mental challenges. Um, and, and thus is, uh, you know, it's a really important topic for us to cover. So if we can, uh, we can play that, play that clip, that'd be great. I was made out to be kind of like, like literally like called like the crackhead. The crackhead girl, the, the crazy girl. Are you retarded or something? And I'm like... Some of the kids used to do that. I would be like, oh, that person's crazy. That person's losing their mind. They don't know what they're doing. I did have issues, but I'm not. I wasn't any different than any, um, I hate to say this, but normal person that uh, thinks the, that negative way about mental illness. It, it just, it feels so bad to be talked down to like that. It feels like you're lesser than everybody else. We have all kinds of phrases. They must have been out of their mind or they're crazy. They're losing it. Like, who wants to acknowledge that they are not in possession of their own agency? When in reality, there's always an underlying picture. Like, how does anyone know what anyone's home life is or what they're thinking, what their mind goes through behind closed doors? When you tell it to somebody for the first time, they're like, oh shit. And you're like, what? Like, it's just, you know, life. To them, it's not life. It's like they're hearing your story for the first time and it's like, kind of takes you back. It is naturally human nature to be afraid of what we don't understand. People think that I'm angry all the time, I'm unapproachable, I'm intimidating, um, but really that's just what they've caught me, or they may have caught me on a bad day, and um, you know, that's not who I am, but now I'm labeled as that. And I feel like it, it's like the self-fulfilling prophecy as well. If someone's constantly telling you, you're this, you're this, you're that, then you kind of start to believe it. There's a tremendous shame that comes with having a mental illness. Uh, and that's a huge barrier. That's a huge part of the problem. You don't see that kind of shame with most other medical illnesses. You leave people to make these assumptions about those that suffer with mental illness rather than letting us actually speak our story and say, hey, this is how these symptoms actually affect a human. You know, you, you get labeled crazy in, in a and a, and a criminal, uh, but really, you're just you're just somebody that needs 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 a hand, you know. Sometimes can't do it all by ourselves. So to date, we have done 41 interviews 
uh, I believe eight or so um, have been with experts and another eight or so, give or take, have been advocates, parents, um, you know, siblings. Uh, but the rest have been, you know, directly with people with lived experience. And, and joining us now is, is one of uh, our amazing interviewees, one of our heroes. Uh, this is Morgan. She appeared, uh, you saw her in both of the previous clips. Uh, so we'd like, to, we'd like to welcome Morgan to the discussion. Hello, Morgan. Hi, guys. <laughs> Tell you how happy we are to see you again. It's actually been a while. The last time we saw Morgan, there was a potential hurricane closing in on Miami, and uh, we did her interview and and got out just before it missed. But we're grateful for that. It's good to see you. Uh, would you mind if we ask you. you a few questions? Of course. Excellent. Um, I think I think the best way to start is for you to first, if you don't mind, if you can tell our audience some of the past struggles you've had um, with your mental health concerns? Um, I guess my mental health concerns started when I was about 14. Um, just really, really bad depression, anxiety. Um, I started to self-harm. Um, my home life was pretty abusive. I um, didn't know how to deal with all of it going on. School was really small, so everyone knew everything about everybody. And um, I just, I internalized it all. And then I kept it all inside. Um, you know, a couple suicide attempts because it was just all snowball effect. And everything was piling on top of each other. And I just had no sense of control of my emotions or will to live. And so um, after, you know, a lot of years of therapy and a lot of self-actualization and realization, I can and, and I am able to talk about it more openly now. Um, and I just, I'm here to share and try and let other people know that it's okay, you know, not to be okay all the time and that it actually does get better, even though it's hard to believe in the moment. And one thing, Morgan, that's very interesting about your story is I, I think, you know, there's a tendency sometimes, especially among teens, to think that it's the troubled kids or the kids with learning disabilities or the kids who kind of are quiet and, and offstandish in their, in their class that are the ones that have these potential issues. Where were you in that, in, in, in that role as far as that was concerned in high school? So in high school, it's funny. I like I said, I went to a really, really small high school. Um, I actually was, you know, a, a popular girl in my class. I was homecoming queen. I um, I dated the star football player. Um, no one knew about any of my issues. You know, I kept it all very, very hidden. I played sports. Uh, I was on the varsity team since I was a freshman. So on the outside, it looks very, you know, oh my gosh, like. I want to be her. She's so pretty, yada, yada, yada. But on the inside, it was, it was just all, you know, uh, like, I just felt like I couldn't uh, show my struggles because everyone would just judge me and, you know, like going back to the stigma thing, call me crazy or psycho and stuff. So it's um, strange having to hide what you're truly feeling from the world. <laughs> And Morgan, what made you want to participate in our film? Um, well, I really just, like I, like I want to be able to um, show my message and reach younger people and, you know, get my story out there and have people see and realize that mental illness sometimes can turn into a gift and you can go out and help others and help others you know, feel okay with them themselves and have empathy and have them open up to you and um, just realize that in the end, like everything will be, but everything will get better. And I just want I just wanted to, you know, get my story out there and have it be a relatable one. And it's been a long time since high school. Um, can you tell us where you are today and how you're feeling? Yeah, so um, I've actually moved a couple different cities. Um, so I'm currently in Miami. I'm 27 years old and I actually work for a great 
program. It's called the Criminal Mental Health Project. Um, and you know, it's just funny how you, I would have never seen this back in high school. I would have never, I never even saw myself graduating high school. So it's, it's really interesting to be in the spot that I'm now in because I am literally taking everything I went through and helping other people. Um, you know, our program, we, we help people get out of the jail and incarceration system that have a serious mental illness. And I think that's amazing. And it really helps me feel like I'm making a difference in the world. And that's all I really ever wanted to do with my struggles. That's oh, phenomenal, Morgan. Uh, we're so proud of you. <laughs> um, <laughs> is there value, uh, you know, to having endured and, and, and overcome, you know, your, your mental health challenges? Of course, of course. Um, it definitely has made me such a strong person. Um, I am able to talk to others about it and I'm, I'm not embarrassed or I don't feel as much shame as I used to, although I know it can be difficult to open up and talk about. Um, but I really, I wouldn't, looking back, I wouldn't have changed anything I went through because it's, it's my story. It makes me who I am, beautiful inside and out because, you know, there is, there is beauty in pain. That's fantastic. Um, just a couple more questions if we have time. Well, I was curious about your thoughts on uh, your observations, I should say, on today's mental health trends with youth populations. Have you had the opportunity to observe or see or, or have some sort of perception of what it's like? Um, I have. So I think the youth in America is, is especially, um, it's, it's harder to deal with this mental illness and talking about it because of, um, you know, the factor of social media and having everything be out there. Um, there definitely comes judgment in that from your peers and what people think and say about you. But I will say that I think it's going in a, in a better direction, you know, being able to open up and speak about it. Um, like my little brother, I know he has friends that are in therapy and, and everyone is, you know, actually okay talking about it and be like, yeah, I go to therapy. It's becoming more and more um, talked about and openly not as judgmental, but we still, there's still a lot of work to do, I feel like. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Morgan. We really appreciate having you participate in this, in this project and taking the time to come on and talk to, to all of these people. Um, and we'll, we will definitely um, stay in touch through the rest of this production process that we're going through. Um, I, I think our, our film, Chris, it speaks for itself. Uh, you know, we are hoping to normalize. We're hoping to, to use that Ken Burns audience that is usually typically very widespread to hopefully open their eyes and they can learn something about mental illness and mental health that they didn't know, um, whether it's a parent or whether it's a, you know, just a kid in society, maybe it, it will just help spread that awareness and make just a little bit of a difference um, in this world, especially in light of the year that we've all been through. Um, it's even more important now than ever. Um, I wish we could put this film out tomorrow, um, but we, you know, we have a process and we look forward to some time in early or mid uh, 2022 to have this film aired on national PBS. Uh, Chris, do you have anything else you'd like to add? I just think that, uh, particularly speaking to to events like this, I mean, um, two years ago when when we first started having conversations with you know with the likes of of Tom uh, Insel and, and Patrick Kennedy, um, you, you know, we we noticed that there were um, what were described to us as sort of silos of um, you know of attention, uh, silos of research. You know, there are so many people, so many well intentioned. Uh, you know, an incredibly intelligent and passionate people are coming together uh, now in collaboration um, to to try to figure out ways forward. Um, you know, whether it be research, uh, treatment, advocacy, policy. Uh, you know, I think that just in the last year and a half, thanks in part, in large part, to, to events like this, that we're we're seeing that sort of um, you know. Uh, 
that team approach uh, to to solving the the many problems that exist, uh, you know, in the realm of of mental health and mental illness. So we're incredibly honored um, and feel the responsibility um, to be a part of that and have a voice in it, and and hopefully to you know to help move the needle along. And to all those people watching, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if our paths will cross. Um, somewhere in this very long 10-year venture, of which we're only about a year and a half in. Um, and, and one last shout out to Tom Insull. He was our first interviewee expert outside of Patrick, and he provided us with just so much um, more than you could possibly imagine as far as understanding how to approach this film and what, what will serve um, the, the national public best. And um, he's an outstanding man, a great interview. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eric, Chris, and Morgan. I think that was an incredibly powerful and, and moving piece as part of our agenda. We're so honored and grateful that you shared a couple of snippets of the documentary that it's in process. And, and Morgan, your, your story and your candid remarks, um, truly moving, truly inspirational. I think, you know, for us as, as a company that is focused on the future, on trying to enable um, research that will hopefully um, in turn enable breakthrough treatments and cures, it, it's a long-term game. And there is no question that there are folks like Morgan and so many stories that need to be shared and what the Ewers brothers and Ken Burns are, are doing to share these stories today to help bring attention to some very first order challenges such as stigma and to try to really destigmatize mental illness, um, brain diseases, brain disorders to truly bring attention to a space that you know, certainly needs the attention and to help those today that are living these experiences with the resources and tools that are available today is, is an incredible service to, to the community and, and to the world. And, and, and for us, for folks, folks like myself and for the ecosystem, the researchers that we're presenting today, that are presenting today, you are the reason why we're doing what we're doing. And you know, for us, it's incredibly important that we never lose sight of the human story and the folks whose lives we, we really hope to impact in the future. So thank you so much. Oh, thank thank you. you. We really appreciate thank the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.